Jan for the kind of invitation to give this talk. And uh, as I said, it's the first uh, activity since a major life event. So I'm uh, very excited to get back into the fray. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, the linear stability of uh, solid rotating curved black holes, which is a joint work with Dietrich Hefner from Grenoble and Andras Vashi from Stanford. So, um, so I'll start with uh, a fair bit of background. Oh, let me just uh, quickly. Okay. Um, uh, so this is going to be a talk just in classical relativity, um, classical PDE, um, and it concerns the Einstein vacuum equations. It's so concretely what uh, I'll be interested in, therefore, um, is the global behavior of solutions of the Einstein, uh, Einstein equations here written on the left hand side um, in the usual notation with all the um, dimensions added and so on. But uh, in the vacuum case, so if this uh, stress energy tensor T is just equal to zero, it turns out that this uh, equation is just equivalent to the condition that the Ricci curvature of the space time metric is equal to zero. So the notation here is that. Um, well, G appearing here, the metric is a Lorentzian metric of mostly plus signature on a four-dimensional manifold. So it's just the physical dimension in this talk. Um, now, given that the solutions of the Einstein vacuum equation even uh, display a wide range of um, phenomena such as gravitational waves, black holes, black hole mergers, cosmological solutions, and so on and so forth, um, many of which are only accessible to numerics um, at this point, um, if one is interested in the global behavior of its solutions, then um, it's a wise idea um, with current mathematical methods to study perturbations of special solutions um, only. Um, and so in order to start that, I'll tell you about the three main special solutions of interest today. Um, so the first one is, of course, Minkowski space, um, which was um, discovered even before the ancient vacuum equation. Um, and the space in this case is um, just four dimensional, uh, I mean, R4, and I'll split it into a time and three spatial directions. And the metric I'll denote uh, by G sub zero comma zero um, for reasons that will become clear in a second. And it's just the usual metric of special relativity. So minus dt squared plus dx squared. And um, for uh, momentary purposes, um, I'll introduce polar coordinates in the spatial variables, and then it becomes minus dt squared plus the R squared plus R squared times the metric on the round sphere. Um, just one uh, quick thing. It seems like uh, somebody is still unmuted because I hear some feedback. Um, so I'm wondering. If, uh, um, Sorry, I'm going to mute manually everybody so you can continue. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this is the um, sort of trivial solution. Uh, then more interesting is the Schwarzschild solution, which is now a family of solutions depending on a single real parameter, namely the mass m of the black hole. And the space-time manifold um, is again here written as a product of uh, time and a three-dimensional spatial manifold. And I'm just directly switching to polar coordinates here. Um, and perhaps one interesting feature here, important feature, is, is that the topology changes. So I'm really excluding r equal to zero here. So there's you know, a black hole sitting there. So you have a non-trivial uh, homology, if you like. Um, the metric is, again, well known and explicit and uh, over 100 years old. So it's g sub m comma zero. Um, and well, here's the explicit well-known form of the Schwarzschild metric. Um, so I'm using, um, just for those of you who are pedantic, uh, this is not t, but t twiddle. There is some slight coordinate change that I'll draw in the next picture. Um, that extends this form of the metric, which is valid outside the black hole, um, into, uh, I mean, across the event horizon and into the black hole as well. That's a little technical detail. Um, as far as the far field behavior of this metric is concerned, well, you see that uh, you only have these 1 over r corrections relative to the Minkowski metric. So the Schwarzschild metric um, far away from the black hole um, is equal to the Minkowski metric well, up to this 1 over r perturbation. Um, so that's some of the large scale geometry. But of course, on small scales, it's uh, vastly different. So let me try to uh, draw a picture here. So um, let me fix the black hole parameters. Um, I'll call them B0 for the rest of the talk. It's my favorite black hole with mass M0. And um, well, the second parameter, 0, will be angular momentum on the next slide. Here's again the form of the metric. And um, so as advertised, I'm considering now, um, well, a new time variable and then a spatial manifold where I go just a little bit inside the black hole. OK, so uh, let me explain this. Um, R equals 2m0 is the place where this form of the metric breaks down. So that's the place uh, where the event horizon sits. 
but then we can switch coordinates from t star to some other coordinate that I'll call t here. So you can extend this metric um, at least a little bit across the event horizon um, to some um, region um, and close, I mean, including the event horizon as well. Um, okay, so here's two uh, depictions of the same space time. On the right hand side is uh, perhaps the more familiar Penrose diagram. Um, so it's sigma here is a level set of this uh, time function t, which I'm sure. never explicitly. Um, okay, so uh, the main feature here is again, this, uh, these coordinates are valid across the event horizon, the future event horizon of the black hole. Um, and then you have these asymptotic regions, uh, namely null infinity over here, which is where radiation uh, goes and where idealized gravitational wave experiments take place. And uh, I plus here, the red dot, uh, which is where time-like observers end up, unless they fall into the black hole. Um, on the left-hand side is, uh, again, the same picture, just not sort of as geometrically displayed. Um, so what I'm showing here are the light cones. So this light cone here is far away from the black hole, so it just looks like a standard Minkowski light cone. Um, and as you get closer and closer to the black hole, these light cones get sort of tilted more and more towards the black hole until once you're on the other side of the event horizon, the light cone is, um, so every future directed causal um, vector is actually pointing even further inside the black hole. That's the nature of it. Um, so you're invariably drawn further inside. And in the Schwarzschild case, actually hit a um, very strong singularity. Um, OK, so um, here again, radiation goes off to scry plus, null infinity. And uh, here, just for amusement, if anything, um, I wrote down the uh, coordinate t star which um, is basically the time shown on the clock of, for instance, the LIGO gravitational wave experiment. Um, and so this is just measures the uh, sort of time delay of incoming signals. Um, so there's this logarithmic correction here because of the, uh, if you integrate the um, geodesic equations, one over R gives you a log, okay. Um, okay, so that's the, um, that's the picture of the space time. So again, far away, it's like Minkowski, but close here, you have uh, an event horizon and um, different topology as well. Um, so perhaps just as a heads up, um, topology, especially in electromagnetism, for instance, would cause things like um, bound states, like the Coulomb solution, um, if you look at uh, the Maxwell equations. And in the Einstein case, it also creates sort of things like um, bound states. So I'll get to that more later on. Okay. Um, and so then finally, the uh, third and most general solution um, that we'll be interested in is the Kerr solution discovered uh, some like uh, 57 years ago, um, which uh, now is a generalization of the Schwarzschild family. It describes black holes of a certain mass and now a certain angular momentum, which is typically restricted um, to be a sub-extremal black hole. And the metric is again explicit, but a little bit uh, less pleasant to look at. Uh, suffice it to say that it's equal to the Schwarzschild metric plus corrections that are you know, of size one near the black hole. But as you go out towards um, infinity, um, it's a correction that's even smaller than uh, the Schwarzschild correction relative to Minkowski phase. Okay. And um, in this talk, I will restrict to slowly rotating black holes, which means um, that the uh, black hole parameters B, so mass and angular momentum, are close to these fixed Schwarzschild parameters B naught. And um, what's uh, important for this uh, perturbation theory business is that actually all these metrics live on a fixed space time. So this is the same space time as on the previous slide. Um, and actually this family of metrics then depends smoothly on the, these two parameters. Um, and all of these metrics are stationary. So let me just comment on this um, in two steps. So um, the fixed manifold business here is the reason, let me see if I can go back, is the reason for working on a, a little bit um, on the other side of the event horizon as well, because if I wiggle the black hole parameters a little bit, the event horizon might, you know, wiggle, for instance, to the left towards smaller r. Um, but if I work on a slight extension of the manifold to begin with, then I always make sure that even for perturbed space times, the event horizon will remain part of my space time. So I always really capture um, uh, that as well. Um, and the stationarity of the metrics, um, that just means that the sort of prosaically that the coefficients of the metric are time independent. So it's, it's really a stationary situation. Okay, so these are very special um, metrics um, and they don't display any sort of interesting time dependence. Of course, observers propagating these space times already experience a whole uh, 
slew of interesting effects, but um, as a spacetime itself is perhaps not so interesting because it lacks dynamics. So the typical way to put dynamics back is to consider the initial value problem for the Einstein vacuum equation. So this is a, a very quick and rough primer on this. Um, so the Einstein vacuum equations are, um, in a sense, wave equations, um, a nonlinear couple system of wave equations. And so you have to specify, in a way, the initial amplitude and time derivative of the amplitude of the gravitational field. And so um, more concretely, what this means is that on a three-dimensional manifold sigma, so imagine just uh, sort of the initial time uh, t equals zero, you're given two pieces of data, so a Riemannian metric on sigma, which I call gamma, and then a symmetric two tensor, uh, which I'll call k. And um, a solution of this initial value problem is by definition, a Lorentzian metric G on the four dimensional space time, which of course has to satisfy the Einstein vacuum equations, such that its data at the initial hypersurface sigma are given by gamma and K in the following precise sense. So if you restrict the metric tensor to this hypersurface sigma, then you get the desired Riemannian metric out and if you look at the exterior shape of your hypersurface, so the second fundamental form, um, then you get this symmetric two tensor out. So K somehow describes uh, the way in which this initial surface sits um, curved inside the ambient spacetime. And uh, so I'll just denote these uh, two pieces of initial data by uh, tau, uh, just for notation. And it's well known um, that necessary and sufficient conditions for the local existence of a solution of this initial value problem are uh, two constraint equations for these initial data. Um, that's just pure differential geometry. So these are the gauss kodatsi equations. And uh, the fact that these um, conditions are sufficient is a famous theorem by Shoke uh, from the 50s. Um, the main technical issue um, for anybody trying to solve these Einstein vacuum equations is that unfortunately they're not wave equations on the nose which is demonstrated by the fact that um, you have this big diffeomorphism invariance. So what this means is that if you have a solution G of the Einstein vacuum equation, and you take your favorite diffeomorphism, well, any diffeomorphism whatsoever, um, and you pull back the metric um, by this diffeomorphism, you get another solution of the Einstein vacuum equation. Um, so that means that, of course, uh, you cannot have unique solutions because you can take any solutions, pull it back by a diffeomorphism, get something that looks different, but really describes the same physics, but it would be hard to somehow tell from looking at G and if you pull back G, uh, whether they're the same metrics. Um, but the point of this uh, local existence uh, theorem is then that the solution G of this um, initial value problem is unique, at least for short times, modulo this diffeomorphism invariance. So this diffeomorphism invariance really captures all, all the non-uniqueness um, so as a physicist, you would say that, uh, well, solutions are unique because um, you, the only flexibility you have is uh, change coordinate systems and write down the metric with respect to a different coordinate system, but it's the same physics. Um, another perhaps more subtle point is that um, you could um, um, very well take, um, uh, okay, let me explain this um, after this example. Actually. So here's a very simple example of this initial value problem in action. So if you take the initial data gamma and K, to be the initial data of a Kerr metric. So I'll write them as gamma sub b and k sub b. So these are the induced metric and second fundamental form of this Kerr metric. Then the, in quotes because of the different morphism variance, solution of this initial value problem is, well, the Kerr metric. Um, that should be pretty obvious. Um, so there is this uh, more subtle issue also related to the different morphism invariance is um, that you could take your favorite space time and say it's uh, geodesically complete and somehow very nice and um, sort of captures um, everything. But then you take a small um, piece of the space time and introduce horrible coordinates, which somehow tend to infinity as you reach the boundary of your little region. Um, for instance, you could you know use the arc, well, the tangent of time as a new time coordinate or something crazy. And then it would seem like you actually constructed a very big manifold and a metric on it. Um, but you didn't capture the entirety of the space time because um, in your poor choice of coordinates, you only managed to capture a small piece of the space time. Um, so that's another um, uh, ramification of this diffeomorphism invariance. Um, and so I'll get back to that um, as well. So the question of global existence, um, which is connected to this, was uh, settled in the late 60s by Shoke Bruha and Gerov, 
um, with the notion of the maximal globally hyperbolic development, but um, I don't want to get too much into this at this point. Okay, so this is the initial value problem. And uh, the idea now is of course that if you take um, not these sort of boring initial data, but perturb them a little bit and then let the um, initial value problem um, get solved, what does the resulting space time look like? And uh, so that's um, in this specific context, um, uh, the situation for the uh, the setting for the curve black hole stability conjecture. Um, so here's a uh, sort of naive formulation of it. So you're given um, black hole parameters. The E stands for uh, I stands for initial. So you have an initial mass and initial angular momentum, and this is a condition that the black hole um, be subextremal, not rotating too fast. And you're given initial data gamma and k on your initial time slice which are close to the initial data of this um, initial curve black hole. Okay, so the uh, two tensors, so gamma minus gamma of the initial black hole and K minus second fundamental form of the initial black hole is uh, bounded by some tiny parameter epsilon. And then um, there are sort of natural decay assumptions that one might want to put in. So for instance, R to the minus one minus alpha, so a little bit better than one over R, uh, make sure for instance that, um, you know, that the uh, mass of the um, the ADM mass of the black hole is initially equal to MI. So there are some natural conditions of this sort, familiar from uh, wave equation theory. Um, the conjecture then states that uh, there exists a solution G of the corresponding initial value problem, which now describes a slightly perturbed um, curved black hole evolving in time. And uh, moreover, there exists black hole parameters B sub F for final. So again, final mass, final angular momentum such that the metric G can be written as a sum of the um, exact stationary Kerr metric plus an error term G twiddle, um, whose say metric coefficients decay in time at some uh, inverse polynomial rate. And so remember T star is the time measured by uh, LIGO. Uh, so as the time um, in Italy and Louisiana and so on uh, goes on, this uh, gravitational wave signal um, dies out um, uh, in, in an, at an inverse polynomial rate. Um, so of course, because of this global uniqueness issue and so on and so forth, um, what one, oops, all oh, right, uh, before I say this. Um, uh, so from a mathematical point of view, of course, you also want lots of derivatives of these things to be closed. So that's why I'm adding a few derivatives here. Um, but uh, the other point is that um, typically you want to um, find really the global solution in the sense, for instance, that, um, your space time actually has a complete event horizon, so future complete event horizon, and future complete null infinity. Uh, so there are some sort of completeness conditions you want to um, verify as well. Okay, so that's the um, that's the conjecture. And um, so here's a an illustration of this. So you start with these slightly perturbed initial conditions, then radiation um, from propagating gravitational waves and so on um, goes out to null infinity where uh, LIGO detects them. Um, of course, some radiation can also fall into the black hole, but it's not drawn here. Nobody can ever detect that. Um, and then uh, once you wait long enough, the metric is close to um, the final Kerr metric. And so the final Kerr metric has some event horizon, but then you can sort of um, solve, again, geodesic equations basically backwards um, and construct the event horizon of the full space time. Um, and so it's going to be sort of a slightly perturbed um, situation like this. OK, so that's the uh, picture for the conjecture. Okay, in terms of, uh, oh, let me make sure that this is visible. Um, yeah, oh, let me just move this away for a sec. So in terms of um, uh, physical measurements, so this is the very famous picture from the 2016 paper um, on this gravitational wave um, signal from a black hole merger. So uh, this is the extremely complicated, as I alluded to, um, in spiral uh, stage where you actually have two black holes um, that are dancing around one another. Then they collide somewhere here um, and then the single black hole that results settles down actually exponentially fast here um, back into a stationary state, um, conjecturally. And uh, the piece that is described by this Kerr uh, black hole stability conjecture would be um, indicated by this tiny arrow here. And so you see it's completely hidden uh, by the noise in this picture. Um, and so perhaps also to reconcile this with what you um, might have heard about, for instance, the ring down and the characteristic frequencies of a black hole as it settles down to a final state. Um, so this exponential uh, decay here, so exponential decay, but with characteristic um, oscillations as well, 
Um, so that would be um, a whole different story to actually try and prove that. So there's a little bit of a, um, progress in the math literature on this by Dyatlov and Warnick and Gaich and so on. But um, proving, uh, proving this initial exponential decay followed by a polynomial tail um, seems extremely difficult at this point. Okay, and so here's the, the part of the talk that everybody will understand for sure. This is a, a picture of the gravitational wave detector. Okay, I actually don't know which one, uh, anyway. All right, so um, the history of this kind of nonlinear stability problem is uh, fairly long, as you might expect, given the, I hope, um, convincing the natural nature of this question. Um, so the first general result uh, was on the sitter space, um, which uh, uses a positive cosmological constant, which I haven't explained, but OK. Uh, so due to um, Helmut Friedrich in the 80s, followed by Anderson and Ringstrom in uh, sort of more general contexts, then probably the most famous one is the stability of Minkowski space, uh, first proved by Christopher Lula and Kleinermann um, for general initial data, followed by a number of works, um, including something that I did with Vashi a few years ago. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second. So the stability of Minkowski space just says that if you perturb the initial data of the Minkowski metric, then the space-time metric settles down again to the Minkowski metric um, as time and space and anything goes off to infinity. Um, so there are some no interesting parameters um, in a way that need to be kept track of uh, to determine the final, I mean, the large scale behavior of the metric. Um, then as far as black holes are concerned, there's one sort of general nonlinear stability result without any symmetry assumptions, um, uh, which I proved with uh, Vashi in 2018, um, which concerns uh, curved black holes, but again, in a universe um, with positive cosmological constants. So it's undergoing accelerated expansion um, which very naively speaking sort of dilutes waves and um, makes it so that uh, gravitational wave perturbations decay exponentially fast in time. Okay, so rather than having this uh, inverse polynomial decay of the gravitational wave tail, which are called G-twiddle, you have exponential decay. And actually these uh, numbers beta are now closely related to um, things like quasi-normal modes of black holes. Um, in the um, asymptotically flat situation, so the curve stability conjecture, there are some results um, in a special symmetry class by Feynman and Seftel. So this basically ensures that uh, the final black hole is um, always Schwarzschild. Um, there is upcoming work by Dafer Mosal, Egel Rodnianski, and Taylor on the stability of the Schwarzschild metric, so nonlinear stability, um, under um, a sort of implicit um, condition on the initial data uh, that constrains them to a co dimension three submanifold. The three exactly is equal to the three in the dimension uh, R3. Let me say, that's not black on. Oops. Uh, the R3 over here. So it just ensures that the final black hole has vanishing angular momentum. So it's again equal to a Schwarzschild black hole. Um, ultimately, because the Schwarzschild metric is so much nicer to work with than the Kerr metric. Uh, okay. Right, so um, that's, uh, that's this. And of course, um, many other space times like FLRW space times or cosmological space times. And uh, of course, also non vacuum models have been considered by um, a whole lot of authors. So here's a very incomplete list of those. Um, so, as far as uh, my own work is concerned, which uh, goes a certain route that I'll explain in a second, one might wonder if the Kerr stability problem is just uh, you know, a partition of unity um, of the proofs of Minkowski stability and the Kerr de Sitter stability. Um, one of them being asymptotically flat without a black hole, the other one having the black hole, but having sort of other simplifying features. Um, but the situation is unfortunately um, a lot more complicated. Um, for instance, there exist the bound states, which I alluded to, um, sort of generalizations there of zero energy resonances. The decay rate is very, very slow, causing lots of issues. And so on. Okay, so um, it's still open for that reason. Okay, so what are the um, sort of general geometric issues um, of this curve stability um, problem? Uh, one obvious problem is that you want to prove convergence of the space time metric to um, a final Kerr metric. So you have to determine what is actually the final Kerr metric. So you have to find the black hole parameters um, at the same time as you're trying to prove convergence of the metric to the corresponding final Kerr metric. Um, and uh, there, and so some of these final black hole parameters are determined really by very nonlinear effects. Uh, so some are gravitational waves, uh, you know, escaping to infinity, so to null infinity, or into the black hole, 
and there's no formula that you can just plug in, um, compute some integral over the initial data and get the final black hole parameters, um, that doesn't appear to be possible. Um, the second issue, um, which I already mentioned, is the diffeomorphism invariance, so recalled here. And in order to fix that, um, what you have to do is to fix the gauge, um, which roughly means uh, imposing four extra conditions on the metric G, the four being the number of components that the diffeomorphism has on a four-dimensional space-time. Um, so if you impose four extra conditions of the metric G, then um, well, the, the pulled back metric typically doesn't satisfy these extra conditions anymore. So I'll explain that um, in a slide or two. And uh, okay, so once you have fixed your gauge, um, so someone made your metric unique, really, then you uh, still need to track the location of the black hole. So somehow in this chosen gauge, it might not just be um, sitting sort of at your origin in your chosen coordinate system, but it might, for instance, uh, in reaction to infalling gravitational waves, start um, moving away with some non-zero velocity or some of um, shift its center of mass and be slightly dislocated and so on. Um, okay, so the um, approach to these kinds of problems um, that um, Vashi and I used in, um, especially in the Curtis Sitter stability um, result, is that we use an iteration scheme in which we solve a linearized equation globally at each step. Let me try to explain this and the, um, the virtues of this. So very naively speaking, in particular, ignoring uh, gauge choices and so on. Um, well, you start out with your uh, metric. Uh, so I'm switching notation on you, I guess. So you start with the metric G B0, the initial Schwarzschild metric. So call that G0, that's the zeroth iterate. Given that your initial data are close to those of the Schwarzschild metric, well, the space-time metric might well be fairly close to um, uh, you know, this very same metric. So G0 is a pretty good guess as to what the solution of the um, perturbed initial value problem might look like. And then uh, Newton iteration uh, asks you to do the following. So you look at the linearization of your nonlinear PDE around the current guess at the solution. So uh, I'm using this notation here, right? So D um, is really just the linearization um, operator, if you will. Um, okay, so you um, look at the linearized um, equation. The current guess at the solution of your problem might, you know, might not actually solve, typically does not solve the Einstein vacuum equation. So you might have an error term to solve away on the right-hand side. And of course, you want to make sure that you're solving the problem that you were given. So you have to um, make sure that you um, work with the right initial data for um, this linearized, you know, this update step H naught. Okay, so once you've, um, if you've managed to solve this equation, then you can say, okay, perhaps a better guess at the nonlinear solution is what, what I just had, G0, plus this linearized step. So it's really just translating, finding roots of polynomials using this Newton method to finding solutions of nonlinear PDE. Um, okay, so um, of course, there are plenty of issues with this particular equation uh, once you, uh, if you don't fix a gauge, like, um, horrible non-uniqueness and uh, failure of solvability. But um, once you put in a gauge, this all goes away. But what's the key benefit of this? Well, if you have a very precise solution theory for this linearized equation, so if you can get your hands on detailed information on H0, um, then you can actually just read off an improved guess. Once you iterate this iteration scheme more and more, you, know, you, you can take a limit. So you can read off an improved guess of the final black hole parameters. Um, if you could show that somehow H0 decays to a linearization of a curve metric. Um, and you can also read off other things like the location and velocity of the black hole, um, all um, from the uh, precise asymptotic behavior of the metric, uh, of the metric perturbation H0. And then you iterate this process. Um, so of course, there are lots of um, complications that um, arise if you want to iterate. For instance, while well, you have to solve um, you know, some equation with a non-trivial right-hand side, the metric around which you're linearizing is not Schwarzschild, is not Kerr, some, you know, something in between which doesn't satisfy any equation. So you somehow have to have a very robust um, way to understand solvability and asymptotic behavior of these uh, kinds of wave equations that arise. Um, so that motivates some of the generality uh, in what's coming. Okay, but that's the basic idea. So um, by solving these linearized equations, typically solving linear equations is easier than nonlinear ones. Uh, you can get your hands um, step by step um, much tighter around these final black hole parameters and location of the black hole and gauge choices and so on.
All right, so um, let me then uh, explain to you the main result modulo gauge. So here's a picture taken before COVID. I think every picture you would take now is with masks over their faces. So these are my two collaborators, uh, Dietrich and Andras, uh, still happy before the pandemic. Um, and the uh, theorem here, um, again, without uh, paying attention to gauge issues, is then the following. Um, so it gives you um, exactly a description of, um, of the sort that I uh, alluded to just now. Uh, so you consider black hole parameters B, which are close to a Schwarzschild um, black hole parameter set. So that means in particular, it's a slowly rotating curved black hole. Um, and now you're solving the initial value problem for the linearized um, Einstein vacuum equations. So that's why there are lots of um, uh, primes here. So like gamma prime and K prime be symmetric two tensors on the initial surface with suitable decay. Uh, I'll, I'll give a more precise version uh, later on, um, which satisfy the linearized constraint equations. Then there exists a solution of this um, initial value problem for the linearized Einstein vacuum equation. So that's this equation which attains the initial data, um, these linearized initial data. And moreover, the solution uh, decays to a linearized Kerr metric. So that means that there exist uh, sort of infinitesimal variations B prime, meaning variation of the mass and of the angular momentum of the black hole, so that the solution of this um, uh, initial value problem is equal to a Kerr metric linearized, so an infinitesimal change of the parameters of the Kerr metric, plus a gravitational wave tail, h twiddle, which decays at an inverse polynomial rate. Okay, so here the notation is that this linearized Kerr metric is what you would think it is. You, uh, you just infinitesimally vary the parameters of the black hole. Okay, so um, what's the modulo gauge mean here? Um, well, just like the solutions of the nonlinear Einstein equation um, had diffeomorphism variance. Um, the linearized shadow of this is uh, the following. So you can take any solution H of this initial problem and add um, a Lie derivative, right? So Lie derivatives are exactly linearizations of one parameter families of diffeomorphisms. So you can take H and just add any Lie derivative along any vector field V and get another solution. Um, well, provided for instance, V is equal to zero at the initial surface so that you don't mess up the initial data. But um, basically you can add any Lie derivative uh, that you like. Um, okay, so um, it, it does tell you what the um, infinitesimal change of the final black hole parameters is, but there's still this question of, um, you know, uh, coordinate choices and sort of where does the black hole go and so on that needs to be clarified. So please uh, interrupt me if you have questions about this theorem or anything else. Um, Okay, so um, in order to explain the more precise result that also tells you about uh, where the black hole is moving, um, so it gives you a much finer description of the solution of this linearized problem, um, I'll need to tell you just a little bit about um, the procedure of gauge fixing. Um, so again, the point of gauge fixing um, is to eliminate uh, the diffeomorphism, uh, diffeomorphism variance. And um, very explicitly, the way one can do this is by imposing extra conditions on the metric. So four extra conditions. And um, the formulation that I'm using here, um, uh, I got from a paper by Graham and Lee in a way. So um, I'll denote by W of G um, a certain one form, which has four components. And I want this one form to, to vanish. So that gives me four conditions. And um, geometrically, um, this one for measures whether the identity map from your space time with metric G that you're trying to find, so this is a nonlinear story, um, to the same manifold with the background metric, uh, the Kerr metric, whether this is a wave map, but uh, much more hands on. You just look at the difference of the uh, two Levi Civita connections, you take some trace of it, and then you want this to be equal to zero. So it's a very concrete uh, thing, really. And um, the way to build this gauge condition into um, the solution of the Einstein vacuum equation um, is the following, um, goes by the name of the Turk trick from uh, something related to um, really um, Riemannian geometry and prescribed Ricci curvature. So you want to solve the Einstein vacuum equation with this extra uh, set of four conditions and you're given these initial data. And it turns out that this system here somehow it looks like you made your life harder, right? You want to solve the Einstein equation, that's difficult. And you want to satisfy this extra condition. So you have extra work. 
but it's actually simpler because it turns out that this uh, is equivalent to solving an initial value problem for the following combined operator, which I'll call P. Um, so it's the Ricci tensor of G minus uh, delta G star. So that's the symmetric gradient of the one form W of G, right? So symmetric gradient takes a one form produces a symmetric two tensor. So this is a nonlinear equation for a symmetric two tensor. And the point is that it turns out that this uh, is actually a nonlinear um, hyperbolic equation now. So it's a quasi-linear wave equation. Um, so in particular, you have a well-posed initial value problem, uniqueness and so on, it's all uh, clear. Um, whereas this wasn't the case for uh, just the Einstein vacuum equation by itself. Okay, so of course, uh, uh, one direction of this arrow is completely obvious. If you have both conditions here satisfied, then P of G is equal to zero because every term is zero. If you want to go the other way around, um, then you use the second Bianchi identity. Um, I'll sketch that very briefly later. But um, basically, you can apply a certain differential operator using that the Einstein tensor is always divergence free. And uh, that way, you get a decoupled equation for this uh, gauge one form uh, for this W of G. Um, and so um, then you can make sure that this, uh, so it's a homogeneous wave equation for W, and you can make sure its initial conditions are zero. So then you can conclude that W must have been equal to zero and therefore Ricci as well. So there's a sort of a standard way to go back. Okay, um, the linearized version of this is um, just, you know, uh, tack the linearization uh, symbol in front of everything. So you solve the linearized Einstein vacuum equation, you want to satisfy the linearized uh, gauge condition, which is almost, oh, roughly speaking, uh, the statement that the divergence of this tensor P0. Um, and that's equivalent, again, by a linearization of the second Bianchi argument um, to solving the initial value problem for the linearized um, Einstein, I mean, for, uh, for the linearization of this combined operator P. Okay, so the linearization of P applied to this metric perturbation H is supposed to be equal to zero. Um, and again, the point is that this linearized operator here is actually a wave operator on symmetric two tensors. So of course, there are some lower order terms and so on, but um, principally, it's a wave operator. Okay. So um, there you go. Uh, so let's just uh, abbreviate this. So let's call this linearization of this uh, combined operator P. Let's call this L sub B, so linearized uh, operator. So this is the linearized gauge fixed um, Einstein operator, if you will. And what we uh, do in our paper, oh, this would be a 20 here, by the way, uh, just appeared in Antonis. So uh, what we study is the, uh, the wave equation uh, LB applied to H is equal to zero. Um, but we actually go a little bit beyond what is required um, in the linear stability problem because we allow for completely general initial data. So the initial data don't have to satisfy linearized constraints or anything like that. Um, and I'll comment on the usefulness of this um, uh, in the next slide. Um, so we somehow study a more general problem than what's required for linear stability. And so the uh, semi-honest result, uh, well, actually, as it's written, it's not honest, is the following. So um, we fix some decay rate alpha, um, like a half or something. And we fix two pieces of initial data, H0 and H1. And these are really now um, uh, symmetric two tensors excuse me, um, on space time, but only specified at the initial uh, time slice. Um, right. So the original initial data, gamma and k, or gamma prime and k prime, uh, were um, symmetric two tensors on this initial slice. So in a way, in coordinates, there would be three by three matrices. Um, but these are really four by four matrices. So you have sort of a, a large generality here. That satisfies certain decay conditions um, and similar uh, conditions again for a whole bunch of derivatives. I think eight is what we need. And then we consider the um, initial value problem for this wave equation on symmetric two tensors, which in particular includes the linearized uh, Kerr stability problem. Okay, so we solve this homogeneous equation and uh, we have some initial data, the initial um, amplitude of the metric perturbation and the time derivative of it is equal to whatever we want to specify. And the precise result now is that uh, there exists these linearized uh, black hole parameters, so mass and angular momentum. And now the new bit due to gauge fixing, um, the vector field V, um, the, this flexibility that we had in adding any lead derivative is now cut down to um, only finite dimensional flexibility. Maybe there exists a vector field V lying in a six dimensional space of vector fields that I'll tell you about on the next slide. 
such that the solution of this uh, general problem here, no constraint equations, nothing, is equal to a linearized Kerr metric plus a, an you know, infinitesimal diffeomorphism plus a gravitational wave tail with a particular decay rate. Okay, so what are these vector fields? So here's again the expression. And the vector fields are actually um, completely explicit, basically. So at least they're asymptotic behavior. Um, namely, you have a three-dimensional space of vector fields coming from asymptotic translations. So they look like just coordinate translations um, in the spatial variables up to some lower order terms. And you also have um, vector fields that are asymptotic to Lorentz boost. So here's a typical Lorentz boost. And then there are, again, some correction terms because you're on Schwarzschild or Kerr and not on Minkowski space. But um, these are completely geometric objects and, um, as I said, basically explicit. And so if you now look at this uh, output of the theorem, um, you can read off plenty of things. So you can read off the change of the black hole parameters um, in linearized theory. You can read off uh, where the black hole is trying to go. So um, whether it shifts its center of mass or whether it's trying to um, you know, escape um, in, you know, whether it starts moving at some fixed velocity um, away. Um, and you can also read off the gravitation wave tail. So um, it accomplishes all these things. So just for a complete, let's see, just for complete honesty, um, we really have to use a slightly perturbed gauge condition um, to eliminate a certain sort of ungeometric space of uh, vector fields V or gauge solutions. And we also need to implement something called constraint damping, which uh, originates in um, numerical GR literature by Gundlach and uh, uh, others. Um, which is some technical thing, very important, but I don't want to get into it uh, at this point. Um, okay, so the um, what's curious here in a way, but very convenient, is that um, sorry that we get this description here, which you know to leading order is completely geometric, even though the initial data um, had no geometric content per se. Right, we solved this very general initial value problem, um, with you know much more general than the uh, linearized. Uh, Einstein vacuum equations. And in uh, even more, one could even allow sort of for a non-trivial right-hand side here in this equation with some decay conditions and so on. So this means that this theorem is already a very um, reasonable first step towards making this uh, Newton iteration scheme that I alluded to before uh, work in order to solve the nonlinear problem. But of course, there's a lot more extra stuff you need to do because this is really um, you know, an equation on exact curve space-time, not on some perturbed curve space-time and so on. But um, it's, a, it's a decent step, I would argue. OK, so um, there has been a lot of prior work on this particular problem. So uh, roughly around the same time, um, so actually three months before we posted our uh, paper, um, Anderson, Bechtel, Blue, and Ma um, proved uh, curse to, I mean, the linear stability for initial data with fast decay. So in our notation would be alpha bigger than 5 halves, uh, which actually implies that uh, the linearized parameters are equal to 0. It's a special feature of linear theory. And then there have been a range of works uh, by the firm of Salt, Iran Jansky, and Schlappentoff, Rothman, Teixeira, Da Costa on, uh, well, the full linear stability of Schwarzschild and then the stability um, of the Tukolsky equation, which captures a single, um, or rather two, um, gauge invariant curvature quantities. Uh, Johnson, Han, Keller, and Wang also have results in the Schwarzschild setting using different gauges. Um, and Finster and Smoller have uh, some non-quantitative decay um, for the Tukolsky equation. All right. So um, in the last five minutes, let me just try to um, indicate very briefly um, the, uh, what's under the hood of the proof. Is there a question? OK. Um, so um, just for notational simplicity, uh, let's recast the initial value problem as a forcing problem that's a standard Sort of back and forth uh, in a way, dual mode. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we want to start, uh, solve this uh, forced wave equation, and uh, we work on the spectral side. So we immediately take the Fourier transform in time, or in fact in the T star coordinate, um, to measure really decay as measured by a gravitational wave detector. And uh, okay, so we just write the solution as the inverse Fourier transform of um, okay, well, you have to um, pass to the spectral family, so you replace all time derivatives by multiplication by um, minus i sigma, um, and uh, you apply it to the Fourier transform forcing term. Okay, so you get some expression uh, like this, and initially, uh, you take the inverse Fourier transform over a certain contour, 
um, which is very high um, in the complex plane. And if you look at the integrand here, so e to the minus i sigma t star, if you cancel all the minuses and i's, this is e to the plus c times t star in absolute value. So this initial formula here produces you an exponentially growing solution of the equation, which is, of course, far from what it actually is, um, but it's the starting point. And then uh, you shift the contour to um, c equals 0, so that the magnitude of this here is actually equal to 1. And then you can exploit oscillations to get decay. So what you need to understand in order to accomplish this is uh, the properties of the, um, of the sort of resolvent family. Um, OK, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, explain this just a little bit. Um, so this has, in a way, uh, three different regimes to it. One is the high energy regime, which is when um, sigma has very large real parts. So you're basically looking at very high oscillations um, in time and space, and therefore, as well. Um, and uh, so there, you can just directly prove the invertibility of this uh, spectral family. And this relies on a number of works by Melrose, Vashi, Zborsky, Tiatlov, uh, Wunsch, and myself. Um, in order to capture the various uh, spatial regions. So for instance, the asymptotic Euclidean end, um, high energy estimates there um, are sort of quantitative versions of the limiting absorption principle um, are well known. Um, there are sort of redshift effects or uh, radial point estimates in the microlocal community at the event horizon. And uh, there's also um, sort of simple control to be gotten at the trapped set um, of the curve space time. Then um, perhaps skipping over the most interesting part, Bounded energies, you can show um, that the uh, resolvent actually exists for non-zero frequencies. And I'll tell you just a little bit more about this in a second. And the most crucial part of the proof really is uh, low energy uh, theory. So what we prove is that the low energy resolvent has a very explicit um, sort of generalized Taylor expansion. It has a, a very singular sigma to the minus two term with explicit um, uh, coefficient R2, so it's some operator, uh, then a sigma to the minus one times explicit, plus a remainder term which has uh, some regularity in sigma. And so once you take the inverse Fourier transform, well, the inverse Fourier transform of um, sigma to the minus one, really the plus I0 distribution, um, is constant in time, and the inverse Fourier transform of sigma plus I0 to the minus two is linearly growing in time. And so if you put these two things together, you exactly get uh, the Lorentz boosts, linearly growing in time and translations and um, linearized curve metrics, which are uh, stationary in time. OK, so this explicit description of low energy resolvent uh, gives you um, the result ultimately. OK, so um, what this, oops. Um, so this uses actually very directly uh, results from the physics literature going back to Reggie Wheeler in the 50s, and then use the version by Kodama and Ishibashi from the uh, knots on mode stability for um, black holes um, and works by uh, these named authors on low energy analysis. Um, and there has been lots of work on um, low energy uh, theory for um, waves on asymptotically flat space times like Kerr. Um, OK, so in the interest of time, uh, 49, um, I'll just very briefly mention that sort of uh, a souped up version of this low energy um, analysis allows one to um, prove Price's law, for instance, for Kerr space times, which uh, says that scalar waves decay at precisely the t to the minus 3 rate with an, with an explicit constant, um, which was proved previously by Aritakis, Angelopoulos, and Gaich, and Schwarzschild. And the main ingredient here in uh, my proof is, again, a precise resolvent description where you have um, a singular term, which upon Fourier transform exactly gives rise to this uh, concrete leading order term. OK, so low energy analysis is some of the, uh, the key, key point here. Um, and so um, just very briefly, I want to um, indicate sort of where mode stability um, in particular comes from. So there is somehow um, uh, some, some people like to argue that some mode stability by itself doesn't buy you anything. And you know, um, that's, of course, in general, very true. But once one combines it with uh, these kinds of robust high energy estimates and um, uh, sort of a priori estimates for uh, the spectral family, then actually mode stability is uh, sort of the um, nail in the coffin that gives you um, de decay results and so on. Um, so just very, uh, very roughly here, uh, let me just talk one bit about the zero energy analysis to demonstrate that it's not some horrible calculation, but actually very conceptual. Um, so 
so, I mean, zero energy being where all the interesting action happens. So suppose uh, you have a, a metric perturbation H, which is a zero mode. So meaning it's time independent. So that's the time frequency zero. And it has a certain decay, so one over R. And it satisfies the, um, the linearized equation at frequency zero. Okay, so that just means, well, it satisfies this equation. Um, then, as I mentioned before, there's this trick involving the second Bianchi identity, which allows you to get a decoupled wave equation for the gauge part here. So I, I'm writing it down here um, if you want to look at it afterwards. But the upshot is that you get a decoupled uh, wave equation for this one form, uh, basic divergence of H. Um, and uh, then you use sort of mode stability results for that to deduce that actually um, this uh, linearized gauge condition had to be satisfied. Okay, so this is um, sort of you, you reduce things uh, to understanding uh, bound states and so on for a one form wave operator, which was already more benign than symmetric two tensors. Once you know that this gauge condition is satisfied, then, well, you plug it into here, you see that also the linearized Einstein equation is satisfied. So now you're in a position, once you have this linearized Einstein equation, to appeal to the physics literature. And uh, so Moncrief, Zerilli, Vishpresh, and so on. So lots of additional authors in these dots. And you deduce from this equation here, from the linearized Einstein equation, that the metric has to be equal to a linearized Kerr metric. So I'm working at Schwartz right now, um, plus um, a Lie derivative. So here I'm switching rotation to uh, symmetric gradients of one forms is the same thing as Lie derivatives of vector fields up to metric isomorphisms. Um, okay, so you get this result here, but now you remember you still um, you work with a uh, in a particular gauge. So once you put this here into the gauge condition, you get an extra condition on uh, what these uh, one forms omega or these vector fields V can be. Um, and again, that's a one form calculation and you can uh, find the kernel of this uh, equation and so on. Um, so very concretely, for instance, um, a uh, so let's try to find some uh, Lie derivatives which are actually zero modes of your equation. Um, okay, so let's take a metric perturbation which is a symmetric gradient or Lie derivative it's automatically, as I mentioned multiple times, a solution of the linearized Einstein equation because it just amounts to a coordinate change. But uh, when does it satisfy the gauge condition? Well, plug it into the gauge condition. Turns out you get just one half times the um, tensor wave operator on one forms. Um, and okay, so that you need to solve for some stationary one form omega. And you want to make sure that um, the symmetric gradient has the required decay for it to actually appear and resolve an expansion. Um, well, and given that the space time is asymptotically equal to the Minkowski metric, one very natural candidate for omega would be, well, a translation. And it turns out that indeed, uh, also for perturbed space times, you can sort of correct this translation by some more decaying terms and construct a zero mode that way. Um, so this is roughly, very roughly how these things uh, come about. All right, and uh, that's the um, end of the talk. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll take questions happily. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, are there questions? Uh, I, I have a question, Jan Drazinski. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about tools. So do, do you really use uh, uh, micro-local micro uh, uh, analysis like uh, pseudo-differential operators, um, Fourier, Fourier analysis and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So um, the uh, so in the paper itself, there is actually um, I think none of that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it uh, it's all contained in these tools that we use. So um, for instance. Um, um, so the proofs, for instance, of these high energy estimates are um, very much microlocal, right? So in this high energy regime, uh, what determines whether or not one has invertibility and you know quantitative estimates for these operators um, are properties of the null geodesic flow, like trapping and horizons and redshift uh, effects and so on. Um, and in order to extract quantitative estimates for the sort of quantized PDE out of this, that relies very heavily on uh, microlocal tools. But um, as a matter of fact, in the, um, in the linear stability paper itself, we can use these things as uh, black boxes just to provide us with, um, you know, with norm bounds on this uh, resolvent here between Sobolev spaces. Um, 
but yeah, the proofs of all these results are definitely very um, heavily microlocal. So, so high energy estimates are, are um, use uh, Fourier analysis, but uh, and what about low energy? Um, right, so um, at lower energies, um, even then, so um, uh, let me see what's the, um, so for instance, the, um, so even uh, so even for bounded energy, so the zero energy limit is uh, uh, yet more special. So for that, uh, we use some recent papers by uh, Bashi on the low energy resolvent and uh, a limiting absorption principle. Um, uh, but even for bounded energies, um, it's uh, very convenient to use these microlocal tools. So uh, close to the black hole in order to get uh, estimates at the event horizon. And uh, then also at spatial infinity um, where um, so even for bounded energy, I mean, okay, even just the Euclidean Laplacian, uh, the spectral family thereof, is somehow non-elliptic at infinity, uh, which is demonstrated by the fact that uh, its solutions are not just rapidly decaying at infinity for real sigma, uh, but have a very particular um, asymptotic behavior given by outgoing spherical wave and so on. Um, so somehow, whenever one deals with uh, these non-elliptic phenomena, um, uh, it's very convenient to use microlocal tools, and that's indeed what's what's happening. So for instance, this uh, early paper by Melrose on Euclidean, um, I'm blanking on the name right now, from 94, a paper on Euclidean spectral theory, um, that sort of gives a very um, uh, conceptual point of view to understanding uh, limiting absorption principles for um, asymptotic Euclidean operators uh, resolvents, um, which is very microlocal. Um, and the zero energy limit is then uh, sort of more um, delicate than that because there's this transition from having limiting absorption principle to just having to uh, invert an actual elliptic operator and somehow capturing exactly the way in which um, these two regimes interact um, is also accomplished by sort of geometric microlocal tools. So um, for instance, uh, it's inspired by, um, let's see. So Guillermo, Hassel, and Sikora have a very detailed description of the low energy resolvent for um, asymptotically Euclidean or conic manifolds, um, where all these various regimes um, so, uh, uh, are um, disentangled very carefully. So concretely, again, we use these work, works by Bashi on uh, low energy resolvent estimates. But uh, yeah, so um, I think there's uh, basically no energy estimate in this uh, paper, except perhaps for proving that um, you have an a priori exponential bound on the solution. But, that's uh, that's sort of trivial uh, to get. The the another question is so so this was uh, linear stability. So how mm -hmm. far is uh, nonlinear stability? Um, well, one doesn't know until one has a proof. So um, <laughs> math is hard. So I mean, you know, we're working on it, but. Um, uh, um, so, for instance, one thing that one needs to do is, um, uh, so there's even something to, okay, so there are several things. So the first thing, for instance, would be, uh, let's go back here to this uh, Newton iteration. Uh, so the obvious thing uh, is that, uh, for instance, you would have to understand linear equations on space times, which are equal to a curve space time, plus something decaying at a particular inverse polynomial rate. So you cannot use the Fourier transform anymore to solve these wave equations because it's a wave equation, a non-stationary background. Um, and so then um, sort of the um, usual uh, sort of point of view is that um, you can get invertibility for you know, in quantitative control on the corresponding wave equations by combining two things. So one thing is uh, control of high frequencies. So now on space time, um, which is based on geometric optics and microlocal analysis and propagation of singularities and all these kinds of things. Um, so that gives you high frequency control, but then you also need to uh, control um, decay. And you know, once you combine these two things, you control um, waves, modulo compact errors, and so then you've basically won. And the control of decay um, is accomplished exactly by um, you know, sort of Fourier theoretic methods by uh, understanding spectral families and so on. And um, okay, so it would appear that we have understood the spectral family already. However, there are lots of nonlinear things that we need to take into account. So I didn't mention it, but uh, even for the Minkowski stability problem, one has to work with very sort of precise function spaces at null infinity and in this iteration scheme, um, sort of make certain modifications to the equation. So like constraint damping, which I didn't get into, but uh, there are basically a, a number of uh, so constraint damping is a modification of the equation. So there are a number of 
long range modifications one needs to make, um, even to deal with the Minkowski um, stability problem from this uh, Newton iteration point of view. And these long range effects um, have significant ramifications for low energy uh, spectral analysis. Um, okay, so there's already a whole lot to be done there to understand um, exactly the uh, influence of those. But uh, yeah, so then at the end of the day, ideally, uh, you know, you can put everything together and follow this iteration scheme. But um, I am not going to um, announce anything until it's said and done. And uh, I cannot provide a timeline, but I'm working on it. I mean, Andros and I are working on it. So. Uh, and uh, what is constrained damping? Uh, that's, so, yeah, that's actually one of my favorites. Um, uh, sorry, you were saying? Uh, well, I, I understand that probably one adds some imaginary uh, thing to the equation. So. Uh, um, not quite. So one, one does want to keep everything uh, real because ultimately one wants to have a, um, you know, a, a metric perturbation, which ideally is real. But um, roughly speaking, let's see if I can, um, let me find the right slide and then I think I can write on it. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, okay. So, um, so let me try to explain, let's see if I can do this here, annotate, okay. So um, constraint damping means uh, basically modifying this operator. And so concretely what one can do is, uh, so reach E of G minus, and then one takes some symmetric gradient and then adds a zeroth order term. So I don't know, let me call it E. So it's really just a, a bundle map from one tensor to uh, symmetric two tensors, W of G equals zero. Um, and so the effect of this, so this was also actually used, for instance, by Pretorius in his uh, binary black hole merger numerical calculation. Um, the benefit of this is uh, the following. So um, let's actually talk about it from a numerics point of view, and then I'll explain the math. Um, so remember that, uh, okay, so a mathematician would say, well, I solved this equation and everything's good. A numericist will say, well, the initial conditions might have some errors. They might not satisfy the constraint equations uh, exactly and so on. So what happens to these errors as I try to um, evolve uh, this, um, this equation here? And uh, well, also remember that if the gauge condition is satisfied, then you have a solution of Einstein's equation. So you can try to somehow make sure that the gauge condition is always satisfied as, as well as possible. So somehow, I don't know, you can enforce decay and so on. So perhaps what you're saying with imaginary part is, I mean, probably exactly the right intuition that you want to provide some damping mechanism so that this term here decays better in time or in space or something like that. Um, so that um, you make sure that your, you know, your numerical scheme somehow doesn't uh, blow up uh, for some such reason. And so the way this works is, well, okay, so uh, there's some differential operator, let me just call it, I don't know, B sub G, which is basically the divergence. Uh, so if this were the Einstein tensor, the divergence kills um, the Einstein tensor, and you end up with uh, a concrete wave equation here for A1 form. Okay, so this here is, uh, you know, roughly a wave equation. But of course, now you have some lower order terms. And these lower order terms are exactly something like uh, minus, uh, you know, some constant E times D by DT, naively speaking. So you can exactly uh, manufacture a damping term in the uh, evolution equation satisfied by the gauge condition. So numerically, this has, again, the effect that initial perturbations of initial failures of the gauge condition to hold are damped in time. So your numerics uh, scheme actually progresses more nicely. And mathematically, it also has uh, the following effect. So let me undo this here. Uh, oh, okay. Um, clear. Okay. Okay. So mathematically, the effect of this is that um, um, even though we are solving the equation with initial data that have nothing to do with the constraint equations, we still get to conclude that to leading order, um, the equation still has the desired sort of geometric behavior. So if you think of uh, this generality here as allowing for numerical errors um, in the initial data, um, let's see. Um, uh, for numerical errors in the initial data, then um, the, uh, this constraint damping uh, allows us to still conclude that the leading order behavior is still sort of given by, these, uh, by this geometric description um, up to some nicely decaying error term. So it sort of also has this uh, strong benefit for the mathematical study of this. 
if one didn't implement constraint damping, uh, then it uh, might happen that, for instance, there is some, I actually, so I actually don't know what the resultant looks like. I'm sure it has at least a third order pole if one doesn't do constraint damping. And I don't know what the, um, uh, the corresponding coefficient actually looks like, but this description would definitely break down. So um, yeah, I hope that's a, uh, informative thank, answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there further questions? Questions?